Are you ready? See you red. It's time for another episode of Fireside Chat. This is Dan and Matt back with you here. And we are here for another episode of Fireside Chat. And last week we looked at our number one draft pick and what we might uh, be able to do with that pick, if we should use it, if we should trade it, and who we might use it on. This week, we're going to be looking at the rest of the draft, the second round through the seventh round. And uh, we'll be dealing with the second round and a little bit of the third round, probably in more depth than the rest. But as always, it's my friend and co-host and our draft analyst, Matt, how you doing? Good. Looking forward to getting through this and profiling all the rest of the picks, what the Flames can do with it, and what to kind of expect from the second day of the draft. And before, well, just about the time this episode goes out, it should be the right around the 22nd of June, which is where we're expected to have um, a decision on NHL expansion. It's been said that if it's going to happen, the decision will be made before the draft, and I've heard the date June 22nd floated around. Just in the interest of that, Matt, what are your predictions? Las Vegas gets a team... Quebec does not and we might just see like this time next year another expansion team awarded and maybe the Carolina Hurricanes moving to Quebec City yeah I think that we might see more expansion in the future but I think you're going to bring in one team at a time at this point to see how it goes just because there's great implications if another team fails at this point. So, yeah, yeah, I agree with you. I think that Las Vegas is the prime city to get a team, and the NFL has been talking about moving into Vegas recently, so I think the NHL wants to jump on that and beat any other pro t- pro team to Vegas. Yeah, and if you figure, like, the last time that the NHL had major expansion, they first led with Nashville, then the next year, Atlanta. Then the year after that, both Columbus and Minnesota. So I don't see them doing two teams at once because like, they're not going to be expanding to 34. It'll only be to 32. Well, so they did so, rapid expansion last time because they were trying to get the league up to a certain number. This time, yeah. let's be honest, it's a cash grab. They're expanding yeah. oh, for, for the sure. cash grab. Yeah, and that's what... Like at, once you hit thirty, I think that anything after that, it's just purely a cash. And grab. if you look so, at the amount they've put on that expansion fee, uh, you can tell it's a cash grab. Yeah, half a billion dollars. Yeah, that it. No, it's not. Because oh, we really must have thirty-two teams. It's well, the, give me some that money. Half billion dollars probably pretty much covers the losses for when the league owned the Coyotes. Mm-hmm. But enough about expansion. We'll talk next episode if we were right about that. Um, but let's move on to the draft, shall we, man? Yep, sounds like a plan. Flames as of now when we're recording, pick three times in the second round, pick 35 and pick 54 and 56. The 35th pick is ours. The 54th and 56 came in trades. They were the Hoodler and Russell deals that we got those in. Uh, you talked in our last episode about thinking the Flames might end up moving the 35th pick for a goalie. Do you want to elaborate on that a little bit more? Yeah, well, with the change to the CBA, now teams can negotiate with UFAs coming up well in advance of both the draft and UFA days, so that way they can kind of plan ahead and see what the asks are for all the players that they might be interested in, so that way they can make corresponding trades Just a bit of a background there it used to be that you could not talk to a free agent before july 1st and you yeah, might remember which that is in air quotes because everybody did anyway but at least now it's legal but you also saw teams trade negotiating rights i mean you know the flames traded for negotiating rights a few times we trade for bowmeister's negotiating yeah, and rights. We also traded negotiating rights away so you used to see that that was so, especially the draft you'd often see of, hey, we want to negotiate with so-and-so. We'll give you a seventh-round pick or conditional pick for that. And they've, you're right. I mean, there was no official tampering charges made, but it was believed that pretty much everyone was talking to agents stuff anyways. So in the last CBA, they said, you know what? I think it's for, what, one week before July 1st? Uh, no, it's two weeks. Two weeks? Okay, two weeks before July 1st. Anybody can talk to any pending UFA. 
Yeah. So I think that if the Flames have Reimer or Ward or some other goalie that they've agreed to a deal with in principle, they wouldn't trade this pick away. No, because why would you? You you've already got your guy incoming. And we don't need two. I think we have. I think Ordeo can be the capable backup. Yeah, Ordeo yeah. for sure is going to be the backup. Um, so you're thinking that if the Flames, I want to say, take to the podium, but there is no podium in day two of the draft. If the Flames make the pick at 35th, do you think that's sort of foreshadowing that we have a UFA goalie in on the ready? Yeah, for sure. Or if alternately, if they use 35 and one of the later second round picks to move up into the 20s in the draft, then that too will show that we've got a goalie incoming through UFA. But I mean, moving up to the 20s, who is there in the 20s that we might want? Well, realistically, there's only one, maybe two players that may be worth picking up. Uh, in the last half of the season, uh, Julian Gauthier, his stock has fallen significantly. He's a six foot three, two hundred twenty five pound right winger who scored forty one goals this season, but he only had sixteen assists, which put up some huge red flags. And he's a speedy player, so and he's related to uh, former Flame Denny Gauthier, uh, who's his uncle. So that would be a scenario where the Flames could move up if he's say available at twenty three or twenty four. And the only other player that makes any sense, in my opinion, is Alex DeBrincat, who's a five foot seven, one hundred and sixty five pound right winger, who's very quick, very fast, very good shot, and just a dynamic offensive threat. But even then, I don't see the Flames trading up for him. But that would be the only other player that I can think of that would be worth it. And in a draft like this, I can't see either of the, those guys falling to 35th. I no. think that there's pretty much a defined top 20 at least. Um, you know, you have pockets like we talked about last show, but I don't think that we're going to see anybody in the top 20 fall out of the top 30. I think the teams are going to be so eager to make sure they're getting the high-end talent that there's not really... Yeah, you might see a few teams reach for somebody that, say, rated in the 50s. Sort of like when the Flames picked Poirier. I can't see them in the top 30 picks. Well, it's sort of like when the Flames picked Poirier, he was rated in the 50s. Uh, that kind of a thing where they think that he's underrated, whomever that is. This year, the only way I could see that happening, in my opinion, is the teams that have more than one first yeah, round pick. Yeah, true. Use one that's the sure pick and then one that's the reach. But in a draft like this, I can't see you taking the reach and i mean it's not like you're gonna make it up realistically it's not like you're gonna get the fourth round gem no. in this draft i just think the teams can't afford to bust yeah. the draft and realistically there are two teams that have multiple first round picks uh carolina has 13 and 21 and boston has 14 and either 29 or 30 depending on if the sharks win the cup or not so they could reach either of those teams with their second first round pick possibly but even then i doubt it so matt you uh you had some comments last show and you made some notes uh for this show as well about the size of most of the players in this category what do you think of these guys and, and well, their size it's weird you have guys like uh riley tufty um german Rebetsov. Um, Tag Thompson, like those guys are all like six foot three, six foot four, six foot five, and not a huge amount of skill. Uh, like each one of them's a bit. Well, Rubetsov's not, but the other two guys are definitely like three, four year projects. If they ever do make the NHL, sort of like Jankowski, where you just throw them in the NCAA and wait four years and hope that they figure it out. Um, and then on the other side of the coin, you have a bunch of really small players like Abramoff, Debrincat, Gerard, and a whole host of other guys that are like five foot nine, five ten, five eleven, and are very skilled, but they're really short. And there's not really much of a in between those two extremes this year, which is kind of bizarre. 
usually there's some players that are like six foot one, six foot two, have reasonable amount of skill and are just, you know, the typical guys that you would pick in the second round. But this guy, this year, it's one extreme or the other, it seems. Okay, that's, yeah, I don't know if I'd call them extremes, but yeah. Well, you know what I mean, like, uh, either you're getting a tall project or a short skill player and not really too many players in between those extremes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, okay, yeah, you're right. So let's look at this 35th pick. Um, You had a, a few players here who you want to talk about, about five of them. I don't disagree with any of these. Again, it's a weird draft, so I don't think that there's as much maybe leeway as we might have had in other drafts. But let's start looking at these guys. The first guy on your list is 18-year-old left winger Tyler Benson. He's five foot eleven, 196 pounds. Played last year as the captain of the Vancouver Giants of the WHL. Only played 30 games and got 28 points. Uh, tell us something about Benson. Uh, he missed most of the season with injury, but not nothing severe, just missing time. Only played 30 games. If he wasn't hurt, he probably would be rated in that 15 to 20 range. So for value, if he falls to 35, you're getting a player that's just a little bit more skilled than most of the other guys that are in that range. Overall, I think that if he makes the NHL, he'll be more of a second line or third line player, not a top line talent. But this draft's kind of weak in terms of top line skill beyond the first handful of picks. So it, if you're getting an NHL or in the second round, you're pretty much happy this year. You really think it's that shallow? Yeah. Wow, so what do you think for most of these guys their kind of career projected upside is then? Uh, it depends on who you're talking about. Like Guys like uh, DeBrincat and Anderson, they might have top six potential. Other guys are more middle six guys. And there are quite a few guys that are basically, if they make the NHL, it'll be fourth line role. And on defense, it'll be mostly mid-pairing guys if they hit. Wow. So, it's kind of a bleak year. It's, like, last year you were getting high-quality talent in the second and third round, and uh, to compare it to last year, the second round is basically like the fourth round last year. So, it's kind of bleak (laughs) at 35, even. So, not very good, but... The players, you can always find somebody that's decent with any of these picks. It's just having a little less expectation that, oh, this guy was a second-round pick. It's not really. I think for me, from what I've seen of these guys, there's more upside to them than that, but I think that there are going to be longer-term projections. Yeah. I think that generally when a second-round pick, I generally look at it about a three- to five-year window. I don't think you're going to see many of these guys being 20-year-old, you know, NHL players. I think think you might get one or two that might One or two of them, but I think that as as an average of this class of kind of 30 to about 45 from what I've seen, I think you're going to get the guys who are the late bloomers, the 23, 24-year-old NHL players. Mm Mm-hmm. And those guys, I think, if they've been developed correctly, they can be... They're not going to be probably top six, but I think we have some guys who could be bottom six, you know, good bottom six forwards. Yeah. Um, I'm not a huge fan of Benson. I do like the next guy we're going to talk about, uh, an 18-year-old centerman, five foot seven, 165 pounds, Alex DeBurncat. He's a small kid. But I think that he's he like he's a pure sniper, and he's fun to watch play. Yeah, and it, I'm not really a fan of short players uh, in, unless they're very talented. And DeBrincat does fall in that category. If he was like six feet tall, he'd probably be in the top ten. But being five seven and basically Johnny Gaudreau sized, it's 
a little bit tougher for him to make the NHL. I don't think that he'll fall out of the first round. But if he's there, there's few players that would be a better option at 35. Yeah, I think DeBrincat will probably get taken. I th- I think his height and size might prevent him from being a a full time NHLer. But I think this guy's gonna be a guy who's gonna be fun to watch no matter where he is. Yeah, I think even as an AHLer, he's you know he's gonna be a lot of fun. Um, yeah, of any of the really short forwards in this draft, DeBrincat's the one that's most likely to be like a Mike Camilleri who actually breaks through and becomes a successful NHLer of that group. One thing I've noticed with him watching a couple um, seasons, well, not a couple full seasons, but a couple games each season of the Erie Otters and watching Debrin Cat a bit as I've followed him online, it seems like no matter who he's on the ice with, this kid's got good chemistry with them. Like, yeah. you don't ever see that sort of awkward line pairings here. He can play with anybody, and I think that is going to help him out being a shorter guy as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he drives the offense, not reacting to other people driving the offense. Mm-hmm. Uh, the next guy on your list is Jordan Carew. Yeah. Uh, he's uh, born May 8, 1998. He's from Toronto, a Canadian kid. Uh, that makes him 18. He's a right winger and a center and six foot, 170 pounds. So, Matt, here's your non-little guy, the one that yeah. you like. Um, uh, very not a, not a bad kid. Played in Sarnia. Got fifty one points in sixty five games. The first guy on our list, I think, both this show and last show, who's less than point per game and not really injured for a long time. Yeah, he is more of a playmaker, but he does have very good hands, and that and he's a fairly quick player. Um, not gonna blow you away with any of his individual skills, but. He seems like a smart hockey player, and I don't think he has top line upside, but he could be a decent middle six forward. Sort of like a, to give a somewhat of a comparable, Detroit Red Wings Yuri Hoodler. Like just a solid guy that you know he can play, and that's about it. Like, don't expect him to put up 70 points or anything like that. Just a 40, 50 point guy if he hits his potential. Can pass the puck, can score. Nothing too overly outstanding in his game, but just a decent player. I like how you put it in there as, you know, Hoodler with. The Red Wings. Because, yeah, he was much more of a sort of a role player with the Red Wings. It wasn't until he came to Calgary that he was really looked at as that, you know, top three forward. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I can, I don't know, I can see that from him. I think that, I, I think that Jordan, because he's a, he's a playmaker, I don't think that he's going to have fans won over as quickly because he's not going to be potting as many points no. right away. Um but I think that he's the kind of guy you need to shore up an offense. Every team needs those playmakers. They're not always the most popular. They're not always the the most glamorous. But they're the ones that make your scores look good. And that's why I think he might get more of a shot than maybe other guys in his class is because he's not going to be that scorer. It's going to be, okay, this guy fits in well as part of the pieces. You need an Alex Tangay to a Jerome Ginla. That's Yeah, exactly. Or the, the mysterious player we were looking for for Iggy for years. True. You need an Alex Tanga that's less injured for your Jerome Ginla. Yes. The next guy on your list was uh, Joey Anderson. Now, this one's a bit of a reach. In most rankings, he's gonna ask you about either him. a late second round or a third round pick. Yeah, I've always seen Anderson kind of start of the f- third round is where most people think he's probably going to go. Yeah, and he might be there at 54 or 56, but because of the Penguins' success in the Stanley Cup Finals, I think he will go well ahead. I actually think he might slot into the first round. Um, really? That high? Yeah. So what he do is you a see very, that you don't think other people are seeing? Uh, he's a very fast player, uh, probably the fastest of the players outside the top three, and... He's got good hands, good hockey sense. Uh, The thing that jumped out at me is his ability to read the play. And 
in the under-18 tournament, there was a couple of times where he had the puck, and if you're just making the standard play, you would just pass the puck off to somebody else that's in a slightly better position to take a shot or whatever. But he was able to read that there was not a defender in his way in close enough where he couldn't just cut out in front of the net or cut to the net with the puck and take a shot and potentially score. And that ability to read the play, in addition to the fact that he's very fast, made me think that there's something more there, possibly. Because he, he didn't have a very high-rated season. Like, his point tolls are just okay. But that under-18 tournament, he was very dynamic. He scored, I think, eight goals to lead the tournament and just seemed to be more present with his hockey sense than... He was the only one that did anything from what I've seen that stood out as being unusual in a good way. Like, most of the players are just very linear like okay I can pass the puck over to so and so or get ready for a shot and he just seemed to be able to think just a little bit at a higher level than everybody else so and that's why I have him a little higher than we talked in last be. week's show about you know guys falling on the list because of world junior and tournament performances and every year we see guys like this who sometimes go up the ranks because of their tournament performances I think it's a bit of a reach to say he'll go in the first round. I could see him going between, you know, 30 and 35 maybe. But I don't know. Like, it's – I think to base that much of a jump on your depth chart on one tournament performance, you have to wonder, is it just because he was surrounded by some of the best of his age group? Or is there actually something there that we can polish and get out of him? Yeah. And I don't know enough about the player to know. And again, he'll be headed to the NCAA this upcoming season, playing in the Minnesota Duluth system. Which is a good hockey system. So again, you you'll know, like... If you're going to develop as yeah. a so-so, a I'd say, NCAA player, that's one of the systems I'd want to be in. Yeah. And he didn't have a terrible season. Like, in the... Uh, on the U.S. under-18 team, he had 57 points in 64 games, and in the USHL, he had 20 points in 25 games. So he was fairly good in his own right. It's just uh, that it, that under-18 tournament, he was just flying out there. So I don't know. It just it's when you watch players, you're especially in the later rounds, and especially in a shitty draft like this one, you're looking for something that just stands out in any way shape or form that hey i'm different and he was the only one that really stood out in a positive way of being yeah, different I think if i'm the flames joey anderson is ranked 56 by central scouting i think on this list i would probably take the take the pass on him pick one of the other guys and assume he's going to be available when i get to 54 yeah. He might, like, it, you know, I might just be reading too much into it, you know, because it is a small sample size, because I only watched him during the under-18 tournament. So, like, I didn't, I haven't watched any USHL games or anything like that, so. I just think when you have three second-round picks, in order to jump that high, you got to really like the guy when you're picking right where he should be. Yeah. Oh, I know. And... I think it's one of those situations where it also is a coincidental thing that he's a right shooting right winger as well. And like if he was a left winger, I don't think I would be quite as high. Like I would kind of hope that like the Flames would say trade 54 for like 45 and like something else to break make up that difference to take Anderson, but him being a, a player that's an organizational need, plus being skilled and very fast, it's one of those that it kind of checks most of the boxes. If he was over six feet tall, I think that would be checking all of the boxes. So, 
that's I like I really don't think that he'll be there at 56 or 54 um because usually teams do tend to take uh, players that have good ends of the season higher than they're rated even if they're only rated to be 56 and plus uh, with the Penguins being so successful with uh, their speed game I think that you'll likely see teams put more of an emphasis on speed and he is one of the fastest players so do you think you know looking at this list of um, Benson DeBurn Cat, Koru, Anderson, and the next guy we're going to talk about, Morrison. Do you think if you were the Flames GM, you would pick, let's say, what is the central scouting rating of almost 20 picks out of sequence just to get this guy? Yep. Yeah? You like him that much? Uh, the only player on that list that I'd take ahead of him is DeBurn Cat, who I think will probably be gone by 22 or 23 anyway. So... Yeah, I I would take him over any of the other four or three. Interesting. So, yeah. Well, the last guy you pointed out as an eligible player here was Cameron Morrison, a 17-year-old centerman and left winger uh, who this past season played uh, both in the uh, under-18 tournament and he also played for the Youngston Phantoms of the USHL. And he's a... A big player. He's six foot two, two hundred and seven pounds. He's really seen as a guy who's an all round player. He can do a little bit of everything well. He's defensively sound, but he's not going to be your your big points guy at the NHL type level. No, um, he plays on the same team that Kyle Connor and uh, Flames player Ryan Lomberg. Uh, that's the same organization in the USHL. Uh, Morrison. Uh, one person mentioned online that uh, like a style of a Tanner Pearson type and I think that that's a good enough description of Cameron Morrison just a solid middle six forward that can do a little bit of everything might not score a ton at the NHL level but is reasonably fast can make a pass can shoot can bang in loose pucks in front of the net does a little bit of everything. And I think especially if you're looking at this guy as a potential career bottom six guy, that's going to help you out. You know, Morrison can play kind of any role that they need him to play. You're not this stereotype of, oh, you're a playmaker. You're a, you know, a scorer, a sniper, a two-way guy. I think he could easily be and might get more NHL career out of himself than other guys in this position simply because he can fit a lot of places on the lineup. Yeah. More or less. It, it's not like you're with him, you're going to be relying on him to be a top six forward or bust. It, it It's this guy will likely, due to his size and his speed, he will likely become an NHL player just because there are not too many six foot two guys that are fast. But, um,. On the whole, it, it, there's players with better upside, but in terms of like raw offensive skill, but for the overall package, he's got a, enough of everything where he's a good player. And I still think that Morrison might go higher just because he's bigger. Yeah, so do I. I think that with the size of this draft that we're looking at, most of these guys being under six feet, I can see some teams saying, you know what, he's just big, let's take him. Yeah. Uh, I can so, agree. I could see a team that's in that 27 to 30 range even. Yeah, I mean, he's ranked 46 by Central Scouting. I, I don't know if I'd... I think 27 would be the absolute highest I'd see him go, just looking at the players on the board. Yeah. I could see some of the teams who've already got their, you know, their big pick in the first round um, in those top three or four picks in the second round take him. I think realistically if he's going to jump high. It's probably going to be between 30 and 36. Mm-hmm. Yep. But, yeah, he's he's one of those guys that might jump just because of that. Yeah. And for the rest of the players that are m more or less in that range of, like, 25 to 40, a lot of the players are either just either long-term projects that don't have a huge amount of upside or they're just 
very skilled short players that are not likely going to make sense for either the Flames or a lot of teams even, so... Like, there's a number of defensemen that are rated in that range that are, like, 5'10", 5'11", and, like, we just traded Chris Russell, and we know what difficulties defensemen like that have, so not going to likely see anybody like that being picked by the Flames. So, you know, like, that's why some names are skipped, because they just, they're just not relevant, really, for what generic types of players that the Flames are looking for. What the Flames are looking for, trying to take a type of player, yeah. Because especially with the emphasis on size, like well, the Matt... Flames would be more apt to take a guy like Tag Thompson or, you know, some other six foot four guy that might just not be very good, but is projectable at least. Sort of like a Hunter Smith type. Then going with some five foot nine defenseman because you know they're skilled like it, it just doesn't make a lot of sense for us no it doesn't i think for the flames even at this point we need to be finding the most skilled players but almost the the it's very cliche but best player available you can't just say oh this guy's a sniper let's take him we have some holes I don't never like to draft by position, but I think this year you don't draft by position, you draft by player type because these guys are also similar as we get down the draft in terms of I'd say their skill level. It's really not like you're going to miss out on a, you know, the next Johnny Goudreau, I don't think. But, you know, you kind of take the type of player you need over the the position or the best player available. You go, "Okay, we need a two-way forward. Yeah. Who's the best one we've got?" That's kind of the way I would do it. Um, looking at the next two picks in this round, we pick two picks apart, 54 and 56. And I think that if any of the guys above are there, um, yeah, we're still are still available. Yeah. You take them without a doubt. I think if you can get to burn cat at 54, 56, you're getting a good pick. Yeah. Or any of them really. Yeah. I, I mean, yeah. Any of those guys would be good. I think some of those guys you, that we think might move quite high, like Morrison, you know, really good pick if you can get them at that pick. But three guys that were identified here, well, two guys let's start with, who might be taken by the Flames. Uh, the first one is Jonathan Dolan, the son of NHL player Ulf Dolan. And he's an 18-year-old. He's, again, a small player, 5'11", 176 pounds. Uh, played overseas for, the, for pretty much his whole career. Uh, he's playing over in Sweden. What do you think of Jonathan? Uh, very skilled with his hands, very good sniper. His father was a defensive defenseman, so definitely more skill than his old man. Um, uh, I, with his size, he might fall to 54 or 56. He's relatively fast. Just, a the generic type of second round Swedish player that you would like to take every once in a while. Guys like uh, Callie Yarncrock or uh, Matthias Janmark, those types that are just solid overall. And I think Dolan will likely end up making the NHL at some point, but his size will be a concern for whichever team if it's not us, it, you know, because he is undersized, but he does have a lot of offensive skill. So. I think he's got skill. I think you might see him. Um, I mean, he played men's hockey this year. Yeah. So he played 51 games of men's hockey in uh, Timra IK. But I think you might see him get a shot, as we talked about in the previous episode, just because of his name. I mean, he's Ulf's kid. I think you might see somebody say, well, let's give him a shot. I don't see him having the talent to stick in the NHL. I think he might be one of these guys, almost like a Jamie Lundmark, not in terms of play style, but in terms of career, who gets traded from team to team, who everybody thinks they can do something with, almost like a Pavel Brendel in that way too, but never really sticks. Yeah. I think this is one of the guys that has talent, but might not realize it. Of the players we've talked about so far, I think he could be the biggest disappointment in that category. Yeah. Well, it's one of those things, like, if he hits, he'll be a very good quality second line forward. If he doesn't, then he'll just flame out entirely. 
Yeah, so. but, I, but I think that there's enough sort of potential there that teams are going to want to take a chance. Maybe not at the draft, but, you know, you might get thrown in a trade somewhere. Yeah, um, exactly. And, and there's enough there there that... some Somebody's going to think they can do something with him. And yeah. maybe they will, but I just I don't see him being a sort of permanent NHL guy. No, it's possible that he does. It's possible he doesn't. Uh, like a lot of players in that generic genre that he's in, it just depends on if he can take those next steps or not. Mm-hmm. Which is entirely up to the player, and you can't really tell until you get there. So, <laughs> it's fun. It's up to the player in some ways. I think, you know, environment has a lot to do with it as well. I think since we discount that of the yeah. environment the oh, player's for sure. in. You put a, a player too quickly into a men's league, be it in Europe or in North America, you can do some damage there. Oh, for sure. You know, you don't give the player proper coaching staff. So as much as you're right, it's up to the player. I don't think that these guys that bust often we can say, well, it's just the player. Yeah. Well, what I was meaning by that is that it depends on the player and, like, the whole situation around the player. Because, like, some some teams are not very good. Like, say, Edmonton, they're not very good at actually translating any secondary players into actual NHL talent. So, like, a player like Dolan would probably stand more chance of a busting there where other teams that are good at developing he would have a better chance of succeeding. I hate to say this, but I think a guy like Dolan might work well in Edmonton system. (laughs) Just because I think that he's younger, he's not going to be looked at as one of those top six guys. And I think that his style, I think Edmonton could... I the bad thing is I think they're going to rush him. I think either Edmonton or Buffalo would be good for him just due to the style they play and the fact that I think he could slot in nicely in a bottom six role there. Yeah. Not say he wouldn't be good in Calgary, but I can just see him kind of as that type of player. Um, the other guy that you'd pointed out here for the 54th and 56th pick was Lucas Johansson, the brother of NHL player and former first-round pick Ryan Johansson, who plays now for Columbus. Nashville now. Nashville, that's right. He got moved. Um, Lucas is a defenseman, 18. He's six two, 176. Again, a guy who might go higher because of that uh, size. But here's a guy who's ranked in NHL Central Scouting as 26. So, Matt, why do you think that he might drop all the way to 54 or 56? Well, some uh, other rankings have him lower somehow he's kind of all over the place he might end up being a contender for the 35th overall selection even it he's one of the few average ish sized players that has some skills so he might end up being a a better fit for 35 he's in terms of talent and potential he's basically another of Hickey or Anderson or Shillington that generic type of player I don't think he has the offensive upside of either Anderson or Shillington but a good overall player nonetheless 49 points 69 games with Kelowna this season Um, I got a chance to see him a bit in Kelowna I agree with you. There's nothing spectacular about his game that makes him stand out where you go, wow, that's Johansson. So I think your generic defenseman terminology sort of works. I think this is a guy who could be, for a lot of teams, a potential bottom 5'6 guy. Um, I think he's a guy that needs some more seasoning, and that's why he might fall a little bit. I mean, 26 to 28, depending on where you look at rankings. I think you're kind of expecting a guy who's going to be ready in a few years. I think he's going to be a late bloomer who needs a bit more seasoning at the WHL level. Yeah. A rough, or, the, or the HL level. A too. rough comparable to him would be a Tyler Watherspoon ish type of player. Yeah, I think that's true too. Perhaps with a little more offense. And I think Watherspoon's sort of rocky intro to the league makes sense as well. Like, if you yeah. look at Watherspoon, he's been called up, and he's been given some chances, and then they've been taken away, and he's never really proved himself as an NHL player. So, yeah, I could see Johansson being in that kind of role. I think that's a, that's a, a good way to look at it, man. Yeah. 
Um, the other thing that you pointed out that the Flames might do with these picks, and I think you probably have a greater likelihood than Dolan or Johansson, is taking a goalie. Um, your philosophy, as we know from previous shows, has been take a goalie every year until you find your starter. And there's some decent goalies in this area. Um, you got Evan Fitzpatrick, Carter Hart, and Joseph Wool, all three of whom are young goalies. I mean, they're all uh, two of them are 17, and one of them's an 18 year old. And you know what? Even if they don't turn out to be the next starter, you don't know that until they go through the system. And you know, somebody has 10 net in the NHL or in the AHL as well. So we might have some some decent goalies who could turn pro here. Um, let's talk about these guys one at a time. We've got Evan Fitzpatrick, who played in the QMJHL for Sherbrooke and also in the uh, World Juniors Under-18 tournament this year. He is 18 years old. He's six foot two and 203 pounds. So six foot two to me is about the smallest you want for a goalie in the, yeah. in the modern league. None of these three goalies are going to blow you away. Uh, I'm actually just going to tackle all three in one shot, if you don't mind, sure. just because it's easier. Uh, they're all, like, none of them are as high of potential as either Mason McDonald or Jonathan Gillies when they were drafted. What about somebody like a Nick Schneider? Probably above him, because um, he kind of came out of nowhere at the training camp last year. Um, they're okay. Uh, it normally like if this draft was a normal year, like these were would be the types that like say last year these guys would be the goalies that would be picked in the fourth and fifth round, not the second. But this draft being kind of iffy at times, you know, w with a lot of the players, it, they will eventually start getting picked, and I think a late second round or even. Uh, pick 66 in the third round would make sense on one of these guys if the flames don't opt to go that route they can there's other goalies that might be options later in the draft but you're not gonna get a game breaker likely from any three of these but you might and i think with having five picks in the top 66 one of them at least should be used on a goalie just because, you know, you can use one or two on a defenseman, one or two on a forward, depending on what's available, so... What would you think if the Flames used two of those three, 54, 56, and 66, on goalies? I think that'd be a little much, just due to the fact that the Flames have three goalies already that are under the... Like, uh, Gillies, McDonald, and Schneider already. I think two would be too much. But, like, if they did, that'd be fine, I guess. But I, I don't see the need. I mean, if you think at one point, we had a whole ton of goalies who came in and out of this, season, out of this organization. I mean, we had Kevin Lalonde. We had um, Leland Irving. We had... McElhaney. Um, you know, a whole... McElhaney. Keatley. Uh, we had Danny Sabarin. So I think that for a while, the Flames would draft a couple goalies, just try them for a couple of years, and then either cut them loose or, you know, bring them in with sort of a ceiling on them. Like, I think we all knew that guys like Sabarin wasn't going to be an NHLer here. We knew that guys like Lalonde weren't going to be an NHLer. So I could see in a weak draft year like this, using more picks to try and restock that goalie cupboard. Because, I mean, McDonald's going to be turning pro pretty soon. I don't think Schneider is going to stay at the AHL level next year with the goalies we have coming in. So I think you've got to sort of bring those guys in. It never hurts to have too many yeah. goalies. If not, if nothing else, you've got a good movable asset if you have a decent young yeah. goalie. Well, what I would, like in this scenario, like if we're picking two goalies with our draft picks, period, like what I would do is say, like if I had my choice of the three, it would be Evan Fitzpatrick. And I'd take him with either 54, 56, or 66, depending on what's available. And then I would use a later round pick on a guy like Vaney Villalainen or one of the other guys that are available. And like a, probably I would, the second goalie I would take would be a European guy that you could kind of just leave over in Europe for a bit. And then bring him over when they're like 22, 23 instead. 
Interesting. So that way you can just space things out a bit. Yeah, okay. That's interesting. Um, you'd have to be careful of transfer agreements at that point, too, Yeah, though. you wouldn't take a Russian guy, basically. Yeah, I mean, because, yeah, you don't want to lose a guy that you're trying to bring over who's a hot prospect to waivers because of the transfer agreements. Yeah, it'd probably be a Finnish or a Swedish guy, depending, but you know what I mean. Just somebody that you can park somewhere else for a few years, sort out what your goaltender situation, if you want to actually bring him over or not, all that kind of stuff. So with the 35th pick, if you're drafting, Matt, you pick up that microphone and you would say uh, Joey Anderson's name, yes. you said. With the 54th and 56th pick, you don't have to give us an exact player if you don't have one, but what are you drafting? What type of player are you drafting with those picks? If Anderson is in the books, then I would probably go defenseman and goaltender in that order, uh, depending uh I think you'll I think you'll definitely have at least one of those goalies available at 56. Yeah. And if you go defenseman at 35, then you go forward at 54 or 56 with a goalie being the other pick. So like if you say took L Lucas Johansson just for sake of argument at 35, then like target either like Cameron Morris and Joey Anderson or Dolan or one of the other forwards at the with the later second round pick and take a goalie with the other pick. Makes sense. Because I think that because you have three picks in the second round, use one, get one of each. Basically, okay. yeah, I, I think for me it depends on how we use, like you said, six and thirty five. Um, I I would be if they can get a forward defenseman a goalie this year why not um, I think that you can definitely get a goalie with the fifty six pick I'm not totally convinced the Flames are going to have all no three neither picks. am I and I think that you may have to get sort of creative in what you want there but I think if you do lose one of them you take a forward and defenseman yeah. I think you can wait till later in this draft to pick up the goaltender I agree. I actually, so if, to be perfectly honest, I'd be surprised if the Flames used three of their, well, any more than three of their top five picks. You yeah, think so? I think two of them are gonna go. At least one for sure in a uh, player acquisition mode. Whether that's uh, player acquisition is say trading say thirty five and fifty six for twenty some odd to get Gautier. Or, you know, trading the a pick just for the goalie outright or whatever. But I, I would be absolutely shocked if the Flames used all five picks in the top 66. Okay, so you're thinking that the Flames might keep one, maybe two second rounders. Yeah. I, as much as we talked about last week, I can't see realistically six moving that much. Yeah, yeah I, it, I, again, that... I think that six may move more so if 35's gone before the start of the draft. Okay. Okay, so yeah, you could be right. But I think 54 and or 56 will be gone. Um, and in that case, I'd take a, the forward and a defenseman, whatever order it comes down the second. If you've got two, take a forward and a defenseman. Yeah. If you've only got one, take whatever you didn't take in the first round. So if you took a defenseman, then I'd take a forward. Yeah. If you took a forward, I'd take a defense. Well, yeah, especially because uh, the Flames system itself, like we've kind of got a lot of left wingers, we've kind of got a lot of centers, we've kind of got some right wingers, we have a number of defensemen options, and we have a number of goalie options. So like, other than right wing, there's no real glaring hole in organizationally of like, we really need a defenseman, or we really need this or that. So you can kind of just pick and choose whatever seems to be the best asset at the time. Because we're kind of deep everywhere. Looking ahead after this round, I think we've probably covered everything for round two. What about yeah. you? Looking ahead from this into you know the third, fourth, um, and fifth rounds... I think in the third round, if there's still a decent goalie available, that's probably the time to grab one. Yeah, if they haven't already picked one, yes, for sure. 
Yeah, if you haven't picked one yet, just because I don't think we're going to have all the picks, and I think that a goalie is probably the last thing they should get on the list in the top two rounds if we're short on picks, yes. then, yeah, I think third round becomes the time to pick a goalie. After that, we have a fourth round, a fifth round, a sixth round, another sixth round, a seventh round. So we have fourth, fifth, two sixth, and a seventh. Do you think there's much likelihood of any of those picks moving? Unless... Uh for some reason, like, uh, say, like, we're trading down or up, and they, it, one of those later picks becomes important for some reason to include, then sure, but I, in and of itself, I, like, I don't see any of those picks getting traded specifically for a player, so, um... They might pack, you know, if, uh, say there's somebody in the third round, they might package their fourth and fifth rounder or something to move up. Beyond that, not really. So. I don't think that we need right now any player that we would get that low. Um, you know, like, I think we have enough sort of bubble well, AHL yeah. guys. I think, uh... For the picks in the 4th through 7th round, I think you're going to be seeing lots of swings for home runs. Like, in the past few drafts, like, we've seen guys like Rafikov, uh, Olas Matson, um, Gilmore, uh, Manjapan, uh, Karnikov, Riley Bruce being selected... Guys that if they actually do fill out and hit their potential, uh, they could become quality NHL players. I think you'll you'll see that kind of player taken with each of those picks. That makes sense. You know, like either a big defenseman that lacks, you know, several areas of, <laughs> you know, skill, but you're hoping figures it out, or... Maybe an undersized forward that's not being used in the right manner or kind of came out of nowhere. Something. Yes. So those become your long shots. You're sort of guys you're expecting to be in the A for a little bit longer. You're probably expecting a longer development curve on. And they really become the guys that, yes, you're investing in them. But if they don't turn out like a Riley Bruce, it's no harm, no foul. Yeah. You should have more of them in the organization somewhere. Yeah, exactly. And I I would honestly expect probably more of those picks to consist of NCAA players and or uh, European players, so that way they can just be parked somewhere else for a few years and let develop on their own. So when Matt says that, for those that don't know, if you draft an NCAA player, they are eligible to play... Uh, four years in college. So unlike most players that come out of Canadian junior leagues who have two years before you have to sign them after the draft, these guys have four years until you have to sign them. So it gives you more time to really figure out uh, what you want to do with these guys and gives them more time to develop at a younger age. If they're going to draft European, Matt, I personally think that they go older European. I think you go with guys more in their 30s. You can't. Or not 30s, sorry. Um, sorry, my bad. I think if you go older European, I think you go guys more in their 20s. You know, 20, 21. Some you even see 22-year-olds go that, that late in the draft. Yeah, some overage guy that's performing well. Yeah. Yeah, I can see that. And possibly there are players that are re-entering the draft that might make sense. Like a uh, guy like Connor Bleakley, who was a former first rounder that didn't get signed by Arizona. A guy like that might be available in the fourth through seventh round that might be interesting. I wouldn't really bother personally, but it's an option. Well, you've got the pick. You might as well use it. You're not expecting anything to come that low. No. And realistically, with this draft being kind of mediocre in terms of depth i think that if any of the picks from four through seven even play a game in the nhl that it'll be a home run <laughs> yeah i think um i think you could be right there again i think you might see some guys who get a cup of coffee yeah. i think you might see guys who get called up for one reason or another um but 
Yeah, I think you're probably yeah. right. And I could even see uh, the types of guys like, say, Austin Carroll getting drafted. Physical, bigger, defensive-minded forwards that if they actually make the NHL, it'll be as a banger-type fourth-line forward. Yeah, I think we're starting to see that, bang, especially the big banger type, go away. So I don't know if that's going to happen there. But I think for a lot of these guys, the nice thing is there are no expectations on them. So I think, you know, because this draft is seen as being so shallow, you're going to see a couple guys who really come out of nowhere and are able to pick up their game, and they're seen as a pleasant surprise. They're almost seen as your draft day steal. Yeah. Well, if, realistically, if any of them do it, hit, they'll be a draft day steal, especially with the lack yeah. of talent in the top 90. I could also see if there's somebody who wants a player, for some reason some team sees a guy they want, Swap this year for next year. Trade a six round this year for six round next year or something yeah, like that. Yeah, that would work as um, well. And it's you know, also possible that a pick might be included in another trade. Like, say the Flames are ditching a contract and they might need to t toss in a little something to move the player. That's also a feasibility. Mm -hmm. So, lots of options. For sure. Um... Other than that, I think that there's really no type of player that I'd be looking for in rounds four to seven. I think for me, it really becomes a best player available. Yeah, same you know, here. You can take some you can take some risks once in a while. Um, I think you have to get that goalie by round three, round four at the absolute latest. But you need to take a goalie this yeah. year. And yeah, I think it's just you know take some gambles, but really take the player you think is best. Don't go positional. Don't, you know, try to take too many gambles because this is not a year that is great for gambling. Yeah. Like, um, realistically, if it coincidentally, when you go to pick in, like, from all of round four to seven and the top player on your list happens to be, say, a right winger or a defenseman, just keep picking the same type of player if it, that's how it shakes down. Like, it doesn't. Yeah, and I think that's a good way to look at it too. We don't need to go by, you know, we don't need to get one of everything. You don't need to, you know, stock the cupboard if we need one left winger, one right winger, one centerman. Yeah, if if it's the same, even if it's the same generic type of player, like say you want to get five really undersized, super skill players like Manjapan, and that those are the best guys on your list. Okay, it, you know, like I'm not really tied to doing one thing or another in this year like whatever makes sense at the time of each pick is all good yeah i think you're just going for the best available you're not worried about the position you're not worried about any of that get if you feel you got to get bigger get bigger but there's sort of a chance to pick up those pieces that that you're not really sure you have fill. I, I'm trying to think of the best way to say this. You're sort of looking around the organization, filling depth holes at this point. You're taking the best player available, but also saying, hey, we're missing maybe a big defenseman or we're missing this type of guy. And this is where you can plug some of those holes. Yeah. And, you know, if any of the players actually turn out and jump up the depth chart down the road, then, hey, that's all good. Uh, yeah. You know, uh, I don't really see there being any. There's no downside to these no, players. That's nice. Exactly. You, you can't. I mean, in a year where it's it's expected these guys aren't going to do well. If we look back in four years and we go, well, none of them made the NHL. That's what was expected yeah, of them. Exactly. You know, there's no downside to these guys. So if you want to draft all defensemen or all forwards or whatever you take. There's going to be no downside to taking it. So I think it makes the scout's job a little bit easier that way. Matt, looking outside the Flames, are there any teams you want to make predictions for? Anyone you think is going to do something bold? Anyone you think is going to do something not so bold and maybe needs to do something bold at the draft? Uh, not really. Like uh, Most of the teams that are down are down for a reason, and most of the teams that made the playoffs made the playoffs for a reason. So, uh, you know, it's there's not really too many shocks out there, and I don't think that, like, uh, I don't think that you'll necessarily see a lot of teams trading picks like in previous years. I think this year, especially top picks yeah. in the top 60 are going to be very valued commodities. Yeah. Um, 
I could see if Vancouver decides to pull the plug on their team and go commit to a rebuild, which I don't think they will, then they could make up some ground pretty quickly if they do decide to move all their veterans or a good portion of them. But other than that, like everybody else is kind of just in that, you know, rebuilding in progress mode or contending in progress, not. Like, there's no real teams that are nearing the end of their rope in terms of contender mode. That And I think with the draft the way it is, too, outside of the top five, maybe top seven, there's nobody that you're really going to go, we have to get this guy to make our team yeah. better. And outside of those top five, maybe seven teams, there's nobody that really needs that last piece this year. No. Even I would argue the top three teams probably aren't going to get all that much better from this one piece no not really well toronto you know, for I, sure no you know toronto has a lot of other issues that can't be solved with one player winnipeg probably will get a lot better because you know adding lene will help and connor next year yeah i think though that there's going to be a lot of other things falling apart in winnipeg over the next couple of years true i think that winnipeg will probably get hit by I think they might have some lucrative players next year in the expansion draft. I think they might have a hard time getting free agents in. Yeah. I think that that team, yeah, you're right, Lene is going to help, but I think that they're going to have other sort of wheels falling off around them. True. And Columbus, they've got a lot of problems as well, so pull you the RV or if they trade down, it's not really going to help tomorrow anyway. Well, and I don't think Columbus necessarily needs the help. Like they've got a lot of young players on the cusp already. Yeah. And, you know, it's I don't know if they need a new coach or what they need, but I feel like they just need to get the best out of the players they have. Exactly. Just got to be patient. Mm -hmm. Let it build like, organically. If I had some of the depth that Columbus has, I'd be very happy. Yeah. You know, I oh, think, same here. I think most GMs would be happy to have that kind of depth that Columbus has. And why they're so low, I mean... You know, that's a good question, and it's I don't I just don't think that one piece is going to help that team out all that much. No. They're still probably four or five pieces away from being a playoff team once again. Yeah, I agree. So, yeah, okay. other than that, like Edmonton, they're not going to get much better next year unless they manage to find two number one and number two defensemen to plug into their team. Other than that, you know, like Vancouver, I see them continuing their downward spiral into a rebuild, which that trade that they made for Good Branson did not make any sense whatsoever, but I don't mind. <laughs> yeah, they're an interesting team, Vancouver, I think. Um, and, you know, we can talk more about them in the future, but I think that they need to decide very quickly what they're going to do. Are they rebuilding or are they not rebuilding? Yeah, And I think they're sort of trying to do this San Jose style, let's rebuild in place. And it's not going to work, I don't think, for them. So we need to decide very quickly if we're, you know, Vancouver's office, do we blow it up and say, hey, we're rebuilding. Let's, you know, move these guys out, get some value for some of the players like the Twins that we have and can get valued for very quickly. Or yeah. do we let them sort of take the Jerome McGinley type route let them go over the hill and then try to trade them later. And not honestly, I mean, I think we'd all agree with Jerome. We didn't get the most value we could have got for him. No. And, you know, uh, another stupid thing that they've been doing is trading prospects away for no reason. Like, them getting rid of Shin Carrick was stupid. Them getting rid of uh, McCann to Florida, that was stupid. And, like, you can't rebuild and get rid of your top prospects at the same time like it just doesn't work that way yeah i think when i look at vancouver i think that they're almost trading for young players not really looking at where they're going to fit into the organization it's just like hey this guy's younger let's bring him in yeah and like i think the idea Grandland, is kind of he can play in the nhl right now or Lyndon vay and what are they gonna do i don't know yeah, and I think that later on they're going to kind of look around at these assets and go, we got a bunch of pieces, but we don't really have a team. And yeah. it's going to cost them more 
to acquire the pieces they need. I don't want to say it's as bad as Edmonton, but it's very similar to Edmonton taking a bunch of forwards and then trying to build a team around them. I think Vancouver's acquiring just a bunch of young assets, and then they're quickly going to have to go, crap, we need to get you know X, Y, and Z. And it's going to cost them to do that because they didn't do it correctly. Yeah. It's going to be quite a long rebuilding process for Vancouver, especially if they don't start it soon. But, like, honestly, I, of in terms of, like, actual raw talent throughout an organization, I think they're actually dead last. And them falling two spots in the draft lottery is probably the most painful <laughs> experience that they could have went through. So... Because they really did need one of those top three picks desperately. So them falling and getting either Kachuk or Dubois or Brown if they go that route, uh, that was not a beneficial thing for them. But, they, yeah, they're, they kind of stuck in that same no-man's land that the Flames were from, like, 2010 to 2013. Just got to pick a direction and commit. Yeah, and that's where I think they just need to, this summer, pick that direction, which they haven't done yet, and I don't think that they can move forward until that direction's picked. Yeah. I know. I think that's one of those situations where the owner's interfering a bit with the hockey ops. Yeah, I don't want to speculate because I, no, um, I have no knowledge yeah. one way or the other. It It's a speculation, but I haven't read anything online yeah. one way or the other, so... Um, so I, you know, I don't want to speculate on it, but yeah, you could be right. I mean, it could be that it could be Linden getting involved. It yeah. could be a lot of things. Oh, whichever case, uh, you know, at least it's a team that's in our division that's going through that mess. So at least, you know, we'll be reaping the benefits of having to play them. So, yeah. And, and hopefully that gives us one less team that we have to, you know, contend with. In our division, one more team yes. that will be below us. And Las Vegas, if they do come into the NHL, will also be in our division, so that's another team that we can hopefully beat up on. Yeah, as much as the NHL says that they want to make them more competitive yeah, um, right they, away. they're not. But with the new entry draft, they're not going to be. They're a lot like Vancouver or any team we've seen. You know, what Vancouver's doing by acquiring young players or what we've seen from any other team. I mean, they acquire a bunch of yeah. extra parts. And it takes a couple of years to bring those guys together, to get some unity, to get an identity, and to really get the team going. So, yeah, I think that um, Las Vegas, it's going to take yeah. them a few like years They'll to get end going. up getting a couple of second-line caliber players and three, four defensemen maybe. And a decent starting goaltender, but you need more than that. <laughs> so they're going to be bad, but they'll win a handful of games. It's not like they're going to be Ottawa Senators bad or San Jose Sharks bad, but they're not going to be very good for a while. <laughs> so at least that'll be two teams in the division that we can beat up on. Just have to worry about two others and we'll make the playoffs. So... Well, Matt, I think that probably does yep. it for this show. You enjoy the entry draft, and I'm really hoping that, for better or for worse, Tree Living does something interesting. I, I've We've gone a long time without really any Flames news besides the Hartley firing, and I'm hoping that you know we either move that first-round pick and move up. I don't want us to move down at this point, but I think either we move up or... We see that well, even if the Flames are able to sell off a couple of excess players, whether it's defensemen or forwards or whatever, something or you know, use assets to acquire new people. Well, that's what I was gonna say, yeah. Or if they use that 35th pick to acquire a starting caliber goalie, I think that would be the other thing I'd find really interesting. If we oh. see that 35th pick and a player move to you know, the Penguins in exchange for Marc-Andre Fleury, but I think a lot of that's going to hinge on the Las Vegas announcement. Yeah, oh, for sure. And I think that's part of the reason why they're wanting to get that uh, announcement done before the draft itself, so that way teams that have multiple good goalies like Tampa Bay, like Pittsburgh, can opt to just trade one of them off entirely and 
get a draft pick for them that like they can they know it's say pick 35 instead of just random second round pick next year yeah no i agree and i think that it's i mean it we're looking at it, it's only fair to the teams that they know that so they can make maneuvers especially with having an expansion draft where you're going to lose somebody for nothing because mm-hmm. at that rate you know you wouldn't like to get rid of a starter like bishop or flory or vasilevsky for a third round pick or a, a second round pick but it's better than nothing and you're kind of stuck between that rock and a hard place so and the flames and the tampa and carolina can be in a good position to take advantage of that well let's find out how it goes and we will be back after the draft um in the next you know couple days after the draft to talk about what happened at the entry draft break it all down and also to look ahead to free agent frenzy as they call it july 1st when the free agent market opens and i think that you're gonna find that the flames are gonna have some interesting activity this summer it's gonna depend obviously on the monahan and goudreau contracts but they need to do something i mean they need pieces so we'll look at all that and what might be happening as we go forward but matt that's it for this week you have a great week. Yeah, just got a lot to come in the next three weeks. And between that, the uh, draft, the free agency, the development camp, coaches siring, Monaghan Goudreau, trades, you name it. There's lots of stuff coming. And before we go, I just want to remind everybody to take our listener survey. This is a survey we have online. Um, it only takes about 10 to 15 minutes of your time, so not much at all. But this really helps us learn more about you. Not so much you as a person, but you as a listener. What do you want to hear? What do you like? Do you think the show's a good length? Do you want it to be longer, shorter? Are there segments you like that we do? Are there things you want us to add? If you can take the survey, it's at www.firesidechat.ca slash survey. Take it. Um, if you want to, you don't have to, but on the end of the survey, there's a place where you can enter your name and email address. If you do, you'll be entered to win a Fireside Chat and Flames prize pack. We got some Flames stuff, some Fireside Chat stuff. We'll box up and send it to you if you win. It's just a random draw. Otherwise, if you don't want that, you can still take the survey. Just don't enter your name at the end. But we want to hear from you. We're doing the show for you guys. We want to make sure that whatever it is you know, you want to hear, we know that and we can try to incorporate it into the show. So firesidechat.ca slash survey. And Matt, we'll talk to you right after the draft. Thanks for listening, everybody. Have a good one, and go Flames Go! Fireside Chat is hosted by Dan Stevenson, co-hosted by Matt DeBorg. This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.